Hello, everyone. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in health IT. Today's guest is Rahul Reki. He's co-lead of Healthcare IT at Lazard and head of Lazard's Special Opportunities Group. Welcome, Rahul. Thrilled to be here, John. Yeah, so excited to dive into the trends you're seeing. I think you have a really interesting you know, perspective with the work you do. But uh, before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about yourself and Lazard. Yeah, so let me let me start with Lazard. So Lazard is a, a financial advisory firm that works with companies, public and private, on their biggest strategic and financial decisions. We have a robust practice in mergers and acquisitions advisory, in addition to a number of other financial and strategic advisory areas. I've been at, I've been with Lazard for about six years, as you mentioned, as part of our healthcare practice, running our healthcare IT coverage effort, and also running our special opportunities team, which focuses on you know, unique bespoke situations in multidisciplinary cross-sector settings in, in healthcare and other areas. And in a prior life, you used to actually work in public policy. So prior to Lazard, I spent time in the above administration at the White House as a, as a health economist, and some time in British government, some other settings before that. So looking forward to the dialogue here, and my career has really been at the sort of intersection of markets and policy in and around healthcare IT and healthcare services. Awesome. Well, let's start there. I mean, healthcare is so influenced by public policy. What are you watching from a public policy outlook in the health IT, the digital health space, and, and how do you think that's going to impact the sector? Yeah, I think we're in actually one of the most dynamic times in healthcare policy as it relates to healthcare IT in particular really since the passage of high tech uh, back in 2000, 2008, 2009. And in many ways, some of the most seismic shifts are areas of health policy that people don't typically associate with healthcare IT. So there, there are a number of themes that I think have gotten the lion's share of attention, uh, the price transparency rules that have made their way through the administration as an example. But let me call out three that I think are somewhat under the radar, but hugely important. So number one, many folks, many of your audience, uh, I'm sure has followed the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a provision in that Inflation Reduction Act passed by this administration that regulates uh, pharmaceutical prices uh, using a, a drug price negotiation framework where HHS steps in for certain high cost drugs. You know, people think of that as more pharma supply chain, drug pricing, et cetera. And that's created a whole new ecosystem and will create a whole new ecosystem of technology vendors and partners to actors in the supply chain for pharmaceuticals for administering, adjudicating, pricing uh, these drugs. And so that's a huge opportunity. Area number two is what's happening uh, in and around uh, this sort of evolution of care outside of the traditional four walls of the hospital. So I think you know, by now, the entire delivery system understands the emergence of telehealth as an example in home care. Mm -hmm. But the other underappreciated part of that is the cost pressure that that shift is putting on hospitals of all sizes from community to academic. That's creating incentives for adoption for digitization automation tools uh, across every aspect of hospital operations, clinical care delivery, staffing, scheduling, uh, governance, risk, and compliance, and so forth. And so, you know, in my practice and the companies I work with, we're seeing huge tailwinds for technology adoption across this range of areas that, again, people don't typically think of because it's one or two steps down from, again, telehealth or home health, but is really transformative when you think about the delivery system as a user of technology and software in the industry. And then the last thing I'll call out is the... I think in some ways the most important uh, policy change that I view as right around the horizon when I'm, when I'm sort of looking out at, at what might be coming out. And that is a fundamental restructuring of how we think about Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Mm. You know, in many ways, we're living on a Medicare Advantage framework that is drawn from a world where Medicare Advantage was, say, 10, 15, 20 percent of the pool of members. In a world where Medicare is Medicare Advantage is now trending to be north of 40, maybe even north of 50 percent of all Medicare members in the next few years, it requires a rethink of many aspects of, of how that program is administered, from how rates are set and benchmarking 
to risk adjustment, to even how we think about attribution between Medicare Advantage and the value-based care programs on the fee-for-service side. So again, I think that sort of shift is going to implicate so many different parts of the payer services and, and even the provider side of the software ecosystem, and it's going to be dynamic and exciting. Yeah. Those are three really interesting areas and kind of, like you said, under the radar, we're not being talked about enough. What I, what I think has also been interesting watching is, is we've seen this explosion of M&A and investment activity. Right. And now we're seeing a bit of a dip, I think, although I still am posting five a week easily, which is like, wait, this is a dip and we're still seeing so much activity. So right. what do you think and what do you think we should expect from the M&A, the capital markets, you know, over the next couple of years? Yeah. Well, John, as someone who wouldn't mind uh, taking a vacation every now and then, I got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm still looking forward to that dip. It has, hasn't quite yeah, like yet. a dip. I got you. It has been pretty busy. <laughs> Yeah, let, let me call it a couple of things. I mean, you're absolutely right that in certain parts of the market, because of what's happening in the macroeconomic environment, you have seen an air pocket, uh, especially in uh, merge and acquisitions activity, M&A activity uh, around private equity held assets, mm -hmm. where it's much harder now, that may change, but it's much harder at this moment for uh, large buyouts uh, to raise the kind of debt that these firms need to finance these transactions in the private markets, in the leverage loan and high yield markets in particular. But what's interesting is, and part of the reason it's been so busy is, the flip side of that is for a lot of strategics that are well capitalized, so large public companies that are flush with cash, that have seen the valuation trends in healthcare IT over the last few years, mostly sat that out with a few notable exceptions. You know, they're now saying, well, this is sort of like Black Friday or Cyber Monday for buying <laughs> companies, right? And now, yep. now is the time. And so you have a lot of strategics uh, thinking really hard about uh, what their priorities are and how they can execute on M&A now that sets them up for kind of a post-cycle boom in the next few years, taking advantage of the attractive valuations that we have today. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. And I think part of the reason we haven't seen a true deal explosion of activity yet from strategics is because there's still some element of a bid ask spread between buyers and sellers. You know, buyers are saying, well, you're 40% off, so you know, time to sell. Sellers are saying, well, you know, we were worth uh, you know, 50, 60, 70% more just a few months ago. And that's what we're still worth. That's fundamental value. That spread is narrowing and it will continue to narrow over time. And we're approaching the strike zone where I think you'll see a lot more deal activity because both sides see that there's value to be created from, again, kind of meeting in the middle. Uh, and I expect a lot of that, especially going into 23. Um, the other part of this in M&A that I think uh, is gonna be a big shift 23 onwards is the entrance of a much broader array of actors and consolidators in healthcare IT. You know, you've had now over the last couple of years after much conversation and excitement and sort of this being ballyhooed, you have large tech that's made a series of large tech companies that have made real acquisitions of, so, of size and scale. Microsoft buying Nuance, Oracle, Cerner, Amazon now with One Medical. You know, I, it seems unlikely to me that that class of firms stops there. You have large med tech making inroads into healthcare IT in a major way. And now, you know, even most recently, if you think about um, Optum acquiring uh, emits in the UK, you now have managed care that's buying bona fide software assets. So in many ways that the chessboard has many more pieces now than even just a couple of years ago. Yeah. And it's not hard to see how Walmart or Dollar General or CVS could all do acquisitions as well. Some already have. So, you know, right. that ties in on some of it, right. Especially home right. health. So yeah, you're exactly right. It's, it's expanded a lot and they have cash, right. To, to your previous point. Right. That's really interesting. How do you think the, you know, recession and inflation, which, you know, we can talk, is it here? Is it going to last? <laughs> but yeah, right. How will that and how, or maybe how is it impacting health? Care. Right. Yeah, you know, healthcare as a as a general rule, as we all as we all know, it, it tends to be more recession resistant and sort of business cycle to use the mac macroeconomist jargon, business cycle resistant in other parts of the economy. That is true. But we, you know, even though it's been maybe call it a decade or so since the last 
uh, true cycle. I mean, clearly we had a slowdown during COVID, but we kind of bounced back pretty quickly. We know from those cycles what tends to happen. Uh, one, one aspect is um, any shift in employment, uh, you know, any reduction in employment that's driven by a recession will mean that you have people churning out of large group insurance into the Medicaid market and into the exchange market, healthcare.gov, the non-group exchange. And so that alone shifts where you think about kind of the revenue pool that comes from a health insurance enrollment and how that trickles down into healthcare IT opportunities. I mean, as an example, if we're in a world where you know, unemployment, I mean, hope, hopefully it doesn't pan out this way, but if unemployment were to rise two, three, four points, the pool of people in Medicaid, managed Medicaid, could really surge in a number of states that are disproportionately affected. And so all of a sudden, sort of the economics, at least for a period of time, for serving the Medicaid population, uh, you know, might look very different to, uh, again, a, a vendor looking at that as an opportunity, whether that's on the plan side or the provider side or, or in other capacity. That's, you know, area number one. Area number two is when you think about um, what are the big drivers of inflation in healthcare? Yeah, this is at the end of the day, notwithstanding all the tremendous opportunity technology is affording, you know, it is a labor intensive business. It's skilled nurses and technicians and physicians and what have you. Um, and when you, you don't think AI is going to replace all those humans, is that, <laughs> you know, I, I would, I would take the under on that for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I, you know what's interesting, what's interesting, John is, uh, you know, un unlike a lot of other bankers, I love, uh, consuming academic uh, research in medicine. I think one of the fun parts of working in healthcare is you have this entire, uh, apparatus known as PubMed, uh, where you can sort of source knowledge from, the brightest academic minds around in, in ways that are applicable to the job. And one of the things that I see often in academic research on combining machine learning and AI capabilities with clinicians' capabilities, diagnostic or otherwise, is you get the best results when it's the combination of both. Yeah. You know, I, I saw a great study about a year ago where they compared kind of radiologist's ability to detect, say, cancer on an MRI, uh, the ability for software to do that, and the ability of software assisting radiologists to do that. And the latter wins by a long shot. And I think that's the future for at least the foreseeable future from my perspective. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, are there other trends that you're maybe looking at in the MA activity, you know, across digital health or even consumer health? I think it's been interesting, the consumerization of healthcare, if you right. will. What other trends are you seeing from an MA side? You know, one of the big shifts, even in just the last 18 months around this consumerization thing, which I agree with, it's utterly fascinating in many respects is um, a growing universe of companies, including many of the ones you mentioned earlier, that are thinking about the population, not as a series of insurance aligned segments, like people have historically thought about healthcare, not the Medicare population versus the commercial versus, you know, but instead as a holistic, almost over the course of a lifestyle, how can we capture engagement from patients and members throughout their journey? You know, in many ways, uh, a transaction or merger that typified this was the one medical acquisition of Iora uh, a couple of years ago. And that ultimately, of course, is now, you know, pending a regulatory review part of Amazon. You know, that was very much the notion of bringing the commercial, the relatively younger population, pair, pairing that with a Medicare focused capability, you know, more polychronic and so forth. Uh, you know, you've seen a number of the large pharmacy retail players in many ways offering primary care capabilities, home care capabilities that again, aren't trying to segment just one particular slice of the population, but are really trying to provide value to everyone. And you know, what's fascinating about that is uh, the, the sort of workflow tools, the software tools, data analytics problems, they change in a big way when you're not segmenting the population that way. And you're bringing this retail mentality of, what is the customer acquisition cost, you know, in, in again, retail parlance? What is the lifetime value of a patient? And how do we serve that patient at different parts of their journey? How do we identify what's the sort of right service to provide at the right time in that journey and, you know, really intervene and be almost like a first port of call for consumers? That, that's, a, that's a brand new opportunity that, you know, frankly, in the U.S., we haven't really seen our delivery system provide before. So even just 
you, yeah, there's one thing as an advisor, I find that kind of intellectually exciting, but as a consumer of healthcare, you know, I think that's the kind of care experience that people are going to really find transformative in the coming decades. So yeah, the, that trend really is interesting because people want to be treated as a whole person. But on the other side, we see a lot of companies that are saying, I'm not going to treat your whole person. I'm just going to treat your depression or your cardiology or your diabetes. So we see both ends of it, right? I, I don't know, does that, you know, do we need a roll-up strategy across every disease state to create that wellness platform? I, I don't know. What, what do you think? <laughs> you know, I, I heard this line once that uh, all business is just bundling and rebundling and unbundling. <laughs> and uh, I, I think we're starting to experience that in, in healthcare delivery, both uh, digital and, and otherwise. You know, I, I do think that uh, over, you know, if you're thinking about the end state here, a world where we have, you know, six different vendors targeting you know, different kinds of conditions, as you say, behavioral health, primary care, uh, you know, musculoskeletal, you name yeah. it. That's, that, that, in my mind, is, is not the future. It might be a stop along the way. Uh, and it's a necessary stop because it's hard for any one firm to do all of these things well. Uh, there's so much clever engineering, uh, workflow, user experience, design. You know, in healthcare, you have to think about privacy and security. You had to bring so many capabilities together that from the outset to be truly you know, multi-indication or multi-modality is challenging. But I think to your point, there's a roll-up or consolidation play, either from one of these well-positioned, you know, well-capitalized, high-flying upstars, or from some of the larger strategics we're talking about to provide this array, but unify it. If you think about, say, along the lines of an Apple App Store ecosystem, where mm -hmm. there's a unified front end and sort of holistic experience, but they're, you're kind of pulling in, uh, best in class, best of breed vendors in a way that feels integrated. To me, that, that's where this is headed, but it'll take a lot of kind of hemming and hawing and, and integration and hard work to get there. Yeah, I agree. Any other macro considerations that you're kind of watching to see how this market's going to evolve over the next couple of years? Yeah, let me, let me mention one that we haven't talked about um, that I think in some ways is... Um, it is hugely important. And, so, and that, is, uh, that is the notion of vertical integration. So we have in the last, call it five years or so, I think we're now seeing the third wave of vertical alignment between health insurers and care delivery organizations, both inpatient and ambulatory. I say this is a third wave because we had a version of this when our modern healthcare delivery system was just getting off the ground in the post-war mid 20th century period. And then we had another wave of this, call it in the late 20th century with staff model HMOs and what have you. And I think we're at the outset of a third wave. And I can talk a little bit more about, you know, what's driving that and so forth. Actually, my Lazard colleague, Peter Orzag and I wrote a paper for the New England Journal uh, of Medicine's Catalyst publication on this a couple of years ago. But the reason I think it's really exciting is, you know, coming back to our, this sort of recurring theme of, of convergence and blurring across silos, you're even seeing that in parts of the delivery system and financing system that people think about as kind of static and legacy, for lack of a better term. And what I mean by that is in a world where you have payer provider alignment, either contractual or especially via M&A, you know, you have Optum acquiring care delivery practices, along with many of the other large managed care organizations, hospitals launching their own health plans and, and every which way in between, you have number one, call point conversions. So if you're, for instance, a healthcare IT company that's providing care management and pop health services to payers, all of a sudden your payer is now a large provider and you have the ability to cross over, the ability to integrate much of the back end to solve some of the transactional frictions, whether it's claims administration or prior auth or what have you and the ability to pull together claims and clinical data in a really rich way and use that to drive your analytics. You know, until you have that alignment, uh, business alignment at the kind of parent company level, it's pretty hard to do that at the sort of subsidiary in the trenches level. But the, the large players are shifting themselves so that they're almost kind of um, mini Kaiser Permanentes in their own right. Uh, and to me, that's, changes the way you kind of think about incentives for these actors, the kinds of technologies 
that they that they are going to be looking to adopt. And as I mentioned, for for many healthcare IT businesses, dramatically expands what you might think about as the addressable market. Yet at the same time, there's much more competition because you're we're bringing these worlds together that have historically been separate. Interesting. Well, Raul, I mean, I think we've dug into a lot here, and uh, I guess my takeaway is uh, we've only just begun, huh? <laughs> we, we've been through a lot, and we're just getting started. <laughs> I think you're going to see, John, that uh, there's no shortage of interesting topics to cover uh, on this uh, fabulous podcast in the coming years. Yeah, well, healthcare is not going away. We're going to need it, and technology's impact on it is going to be there as well. So thanks for giving us some insights and perspectives, Raul, and thanks, everyone, for watching and listening. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com or search for Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcast application. Thanks, Raul. Thanks so much, Sean. <laughs>